Now, I was very puzzled when I got this uh, um, question, this session, but I, of course I never interfere, because it seemed to me very strange to imagine that it could be bricks or clicks. <laughs> I mean, that was sort of an obvious reaction is bricks and clicks. Uh, and in what proportion, um, I then made the, cr the obvious crack, which is if we really do did nothing but clicks, the whole of humanity will starve to death. So we still are physical beings, and we really rather like to live in physical environments and and uh, and uh, uh, eat physical food and all the rest of it. But it is clearly true that we sort of measure intangible assets in a way that historically we haven't done. Uh, so that's in terms of the economic accounting. There's been a sort of revolution in economic accounting to take count of intangible assets, and I think that's also obviously true for corporate accounting. And so, and we think that intangible assets are very, and they're obviously right, very, very closely linked to our productive capacities, um, both directly in terms that they produce things we directly consume, and indirectly, which I think is probably more important, in the sense that they are intermediates into everything. Now, that's obvious. But I do think before we go into the discussion of what it means for technology policy, and that's the focus of what it means for policy, that it is worth remembering some th a point I've made many times in columns before, that ultimately all economics, all economic activity of human beings is the transformation of ideas into things we find useful, and ideas are the ultimate intangible assets. And without ideas, we have nothing. So in some sense, there's nothing new here. The wheel was an idea, a really quite important idea. Uh, and uh, one shouldn't think that it is all new, but it's new in, this, in a conscious way we think about it. And of course, some of the most powerful technologies <coughs> we have at the moment, AI, internet, all of, are all part of this. So those are big issues. Now, what is it, the question we're going to address is what does this mean for development policy, growth policy, growth strategy, how, how do you deal with these notions in that context? So I'm going to start off with you, Mary. So what do bricks or clicks and, above all, the intangible economy mean for you in Canada? Well, thank you so much, uh, Martin, and it's terrific to be here with you at WEF and, of course, uh, with uh, my colleagues here on, on the panel. And since Martin has given us a very strict timetable, I won't go through all of the wonderful niceties that are here about uh, each of my colleagues on the panel, and I'll get straight into, uh, into uh, the subject matter. Um, and as you rightly pointed out, um, uh, today, we are in a knowledge-based economy. We are in an economy of the intangibles. I like the way that you said it, which is uh, the intangibles are uh, the intermediary for everything, and intangibles are ideas that, uh, that express themselves into goods, um, uh, you know, how we sort of get our goods, for example, manufacturing, whether it's advanced manufacturing, farming technology today is technology that, uh, that helps us grow the uh, fruits and vegetables and, and so forth that we consume. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and in Canada, we've been thinking about this and more than thinking about it, but introducing <coughs> policies and investments right from for quite some time now. Uh, we have a very strong, um, highly educated uh, population, strong university post-secondary institutions. And, uh, and in Canada, I'm the trade minister, but also the small business minister. So how to, you know, how do we make sure that we've got the right conditions to help businesses and those evolving and new businesses uh, get into the marketplace, whether it's in Canada or abroad. So the kinds of policies that we've had to think about uh, and the investments that we had to think about introducing are things like an intellectual property strategy for the country and making investments uh, to support uh, businesses and entrepreneurs or um, or those knowledge creators um, in, in, in the world of the intangibles. Um, creating um, you know a project that really deals with sort of what we call a patent collective uh, in the country again an, a way of being able to um, to support the growth of what are intangibles today and what today and tomorrow will become very important um, 
and significant, uh, significant contributors to our economy. I think about uh, some of the work that uh, we have done in Canada of creating innovation and innovation superclusters. Uh, we decided in Canada that we would have five in advanced manufacturing, in oceans technology, in agri-food and in proteins, in digital, um, because they they are important to the economy of Canada. They build on the strength of Canada. But what are these superclusters? It is a combination and a deliberate uh, collaboration between academia, big businesses, including multinationals, but also small, innovative uh, entrepreneurs and companies that are in each of these clusters as a way of being able to develop the new technology, the new services, the new modality of, uh, of the future through these super clusters. So in Canada, it's probably about a billion dollar investment in the, uh, in the five super clusters across the country, and they become sort of a magnet for more um, innovation. But it also creates uh, that practical capability of being able to scale up or an ability for startups to scale and to grow uh, through our economy. And uh, Canada as a population of just about $39 million we scale up by growing into the international marketplace and uh, and having these big companies to be a part of that value chain is uh, is part of this work and maybe one final point i would say is a very intentional focus on how we make investments to support the intangible economy if you think about clean technology you think about early stage sort of you know research on hydrogen for example or you know on 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 plastics replacements or on building materials none of these would have gotten the regular traditional funding, financing for these innovative companies. So in Canada, we created a venture capital fund where Canada, where we as a government puts first dollar in, but that first dollar in, we, you know, enables the private sector to then crowd in and then to do, uh, to raise additional capital so that there is some patient capital in there to help some of those most innovative, intangible asset companies to be able to grow into the economy. So that's um, that's a bit of a, an overview. I don't know if I've hit the four minutes, but she says I have. So there you go. I think you've, it's been a very impressive and sets a model, and it raises lots and lots of very interesting questions, which I hope we'll be able to mm. follow up on. So now I'm going to turn to you, Ashwini. Obviously, India is famous for its uh, IT sector, very well-known companies have met some of them represented here. I was actually at a very fine adventure um, uh, and, um, um, seminar organized by Infosys just yesterday. And, uh, and you've had some remarkable developments uh, in your identity card system and so forth. So what does this relationship between BRICS and CLICS, as it were, the, the modern IT economy and the traditional economy, um, and you span it in your own job, what does this mean for India? Thank you, Martin. I'll make three points in this first four minutes. First point is, yes, you very rightly said, we need bricks and clicks. In our strategy, our Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji, he has put a very good emphasis, the right balance between investment-driven growth, where the brick and mortar industries also find exactly the same traction as the digital and the IT-related, uh, I mean, IT, or, uh, IT and technology-related industries. How did that happen? That happened because a very wise choice was made, especially during the pandemic. Instead of uh, splurging money on uh, pure consumption, the way many other economies have tried to come out of the pandemic, uh, Prime Minister Modi made a very clear choice that very focused consumption, but a huge emphasis on infrastructure investment. That investment strategy has helped us, and today we are out of the pandemic at a good, healthy uh, growth rate of 6.9% and a very moderate inflation of about 5.8%. Uh, traditionally, we have had inflation ranging from 5 to 7%, so 5.8% is purely as per the uh, long-term trend that we have in the country. This has really helped balance the economy and create a template which is going to be good for the next 10 years. On the click side, Huge emphasis on the India stack that was started in 2016 when Prime Minister launched the Digital India program. Now, again, a very innovative way of doing things. Unlike big tech monopolizing everything in some geographies, and unlike government doing everything in some other geographies, we created a public-private partnership model in which the government put its public fund 
in creating a very robust platform, then everybody else joins. So I'll give one example, the payment platform. Payment platform, government started, government formed, created the platform. More than 300 banks joined it. Insurance companies joined it. Um, E-commerce companies joined it. More than 800 startups have joined it. And 1.2 billion users have joined it. The net result is, in last December 2022, the digital payment transactions amounted to $1.5 trillion annualized basis. And that is, if you compare the total of US digital transactions, UK, Germany, France, combine the four, multiply by four, it's more than that. So it's huge. And it's making such a big difference in the economy because it empowers the poorest of the poor, it empowers everybody, and people get access to technology which generally was in the domain of rich and the powerful. The third point I would like to make is bricks and clicks, again, a combination of policies which have really helped us bring electronics manufacturing to the country. Uh, 10 years back, it was negligible. Today, it is $87 billion electronics manufacturer. Just uh, iPhone exports will be, I mean, the smartphone exports will be uh, $9 billion this year. And uh, the iPhone 14 is now made in India. The supply chain is shifting. The, uh, this one is made in India, right? So <laughs> supply, supply chain is shifting and uh, deepening component ecosystem is coming to the country. A very clear focus on BRICS as well as CLICS is giving us a good sustainable growth path. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, it underlines uh, a view of I've held for quite a long time, but I've obviously, as you probably know, followed India for quite a long time, um, since the 70s. And uh, it underlines what I think is a very important point is that over the next 10 or 20 years, it's pretty well overwhelmingly certain that India will be the fastest growing of the big economies, and it's very big. So uh, I think anybody who hasn't in business uh, um, and in other areas thought very, very seriously about what India will mean is really missing the point about where we are in the world. I think by now most people have got that, but I think you brought this out very, very clearly in this uh, payment platform, <coughs> which I knew, know about, is an extraordinary thing. So now I will turn to Khalid Khumaidan. Please, what thank is you your view on BRICS or CLICS? Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you very much for the World Economic Forum. Very important topic, intangible <coughs> assets development of the digital economy is important. I'd like to focus on one aspect of that, which is talent. We think that is key in order to develop the intangible world, the digital world, talent is key and what type of policies will help attract the talent to the right businesses. Three aspects of talent I think is worth discussing. It's the global aspect of talent, the local aspect of talent, and what businesses need in order to be able to attract talent. Global, we know talent is global and there is not likely that any country is going to be fully self-sufficient when it comes to talent. There's a global nature of there and the way talent is developing, becoming highly specialized, difficult to find everything you need in any country. Another aspect of talent is the local aspect. It's important. We know that young people, local, want to compete for the good jobs that are created in the digital economy that help create the intangible assets that we all desire. And businesses find it difficult. Obviously, one of the biggest challenges they have is to attract the talent. And with that, they would like support. Support in the flexibility to hire the talent. And they would like some support in the upselling costs. There's a continuous investment that needs to be done in the talent in order for them to continue to be relevant. And businesses would like to find the right type of policies and support that they get from governments to help them continue to be the home for that talent. In Bahrain, we did something two decades ago, which is establishing of a labor fund that addresses what we thought were these aspects of talent. Is, and it's founded on three principles. And it's a good example of what could or should be done, at least in our opinion. Is number one, 
the government of Bahrain will not dictate or be intrusive and decide what nationality the talent should be that works for a company. Number two, any company that's in Bahrain that would like to hire expatriate talent or global talent is free to do so. All we request in return is that they pay a small fee to the labor fund. We collect that money and over the years it becomes a sizable amount of money and that's the pool of money we use to train and upscale Bahrainis. Very, very powerful tool that we do and I would like to just share with you one example of how this labor fund helped us attract businesses to Bahrain. Uh, slightly over a year ago, Citibank was looking for a technology hub and we were competing against other cities. They took a sample of the talent pool in Bahrain, they liked it, and they decided and committed after all of their investigations and due diligence is to commit to hiring a thousand young Bahraini coders. Very good, but they're gonna do it over time. And obviously, Bahrain and the government of Bahrain is going to contribute by paying or shouldering part of the financial burden of upskilling that talent, which is important. And this is how we think that Bahrain and young Bahrainis can contribute by providing digital services to the largest and the biggest uh, global companies and try to create value in terms of intangible assets. Thank you. Well, that's very disciplined. Um, and I think you've raised a very important issue which I want to come back to on the availability of talent, domestic training of talent and, and uh, immigration because it's pretty obvious to me when you think about it here, you've got Canada, India and Bahrain. These are very, very, very different places yep. and uh, I want to work out what is common and what is different. So if I may now turn to you, Jan. Um, what is your response to what you've heard? Are they missing the point? Or have they get it, got the point? And what would you advise them? Oh, thank you, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm a CEO of the largest building materials company, so I'm clearly from the bricks category and not so much an expert in the clicks. So um, I would like to tackle it a little bit differently and uh, with uh, the decarbonization of our built environment, with which is probably one of our biggest challenges and biggest priorities in the world and then what I would like to, uh, uh, where I'd like to get help from the governments to make this happen at a faster sp uh, pace. Um, look, uh, the built environment is responsible for around 38% of all global carbon emissions, 38%. Everyone talks about the cars and electric and so on, but building is 38%. One third is in the build phase, so one third of all the carbon is emitted when you produce building materials and when you do the buildings, but the two-third actually is produced every year by operating the building. So all the energy we're using for cooling or for heating, which disappears through poorly insulated buildings, and all the energy we are using to, uh, uh, for the light and for, for other aspects of the building. So this is really a big challenge, and, and Holcim is our number one mission is to be part of the decarbonization of that built environment to make our uh, build smarter uh, with less footprint and make the buildings more insulated to make them self energy generating through solar, wind and other sources. And uh, we can do a lot today. Um, let me share maybe one aspect where I need, uh, where I need your help. Um, uh, so we have advanced quite a lot to decarbonize our own products. And one of the most uh, exciting avenues is to reuse construction demolition waste. And you will be surprised how easy that can be done. So you basically, we take back the bricks and the concrete structure, and it's one of the easiest to recycle material in the world. You all hear the stories about other materials. You can only downcycle. This product you can recycle infinite with no downcycling. So we literally take back construction demolition waste and we use it as a raw material for our products or we even use it to uh, replace freshly produced uh, materials like cement, for example. We have, uh, in Switzerland, we have the first smartest cement in the world where 20% of the product is construction demolition waste. So we literally take back, we have recycling centers, we take back, we recycle 100%, put it back, and it's even inexpensive because we are paid to take the care of the waste, then we recycle it, it becomes a new product. So, so the vision is, I think, fantastic. So we want to have Montreal or other cities, we want to make them 
circular construction. It has so many advantages. It doesn't use fresh resources. It's CO2 free, at least the recycling part of it. And it's a local business, right? We are not talking about big distance transporting by ship or trucks. It's all a local economy and a circular economy. And that's super exciting. So we have introduced the first products. We have last year, we already recycled 6 million tons of construction demolition waste. 6 million tons, that's 1,000 truckloads every single day. So we take, and it's only done in six countries at the moment. It's Switzerland, France, Germany, Canada is a big one. We took back about 1 million tons of construction demolition waste and make a new product out of that, you know, and you have different qualities. So you have lower qualities you put into road construction. You have better qualities you put into concrete and the uh, championship recycling you can put even in the cement. So very exciting. And we are ready to go to 50% recycling content in our traditional construction products. Um, what is the, the bottleneck or, or let's say the area we need to um, accelerate is are the building codes. So our products are ready. So I just shared with you 20% is already allowed in Switzerland. And this is not a niche product for us. That's our second biggest selling product as of today. And we're going to bring that to European Union. They take about four years longer to adjust the building codes and allow me to have this uh, recycling inside the product. And then, but then we already can go up to 35% of recycling. In practice, we can go up to 50%. So that's my just small inspiration of today. I wish we can work out an acceleration, building codes to make that circular recycling a reality in basically all our metropolitan areas. And we are local, we are inexpensive, we are CO2 free, and, and doesn't need that much. We are happy to make the investments for the supply chain but we need the building codes to allow us uh, to use those products. I hope I was not too practical in my, in my brick well, world. Well, that certainly um, <laughs> clicks for the modern, uh, bricks for the modern era, as it were, thinking about, um, and I can't imagine a world in which we won't want buildings. So um, human beings have been doing that for quite a long time. So uh, ha having them um, being, um, um, more ecologically um, or less ecologically destructive as a, as a process is obviously very, very um, important. There are quite a few questions that came out of this. I'll just follow up for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then um, we'll have about 10, perhaps a little bit more minutes for questions. Uh, so you can all think of your brilliant questions. Uh, the there are rules about questions. The most important, I've generally failed, but I get somewhere towards it, is there's a difference between a question mark, a question and a statement, and I want a question. And <laughs> secondly, I promise you, most questions can be asked in one sentence. So please try, um, because it's impossible. And no, I have three questions stuff. Or, mm -hmm. So uh, that way we might get through it. Um, I'm uh, interested in something that, that you, Mary, and, well, actually, the three ministers all really brought out. The way you see, all three of you see this in a remarkably sim similar way in one respect. It's all public-private partnerships, essentially, um, with the public sector providing venture capital in conjunction with, with uh, the private sector, providing skill and education, that's clearly a public good for uh, the private sector. And um, you talk particularly about the creation of a platform as a public, that was essentially public uh, creation. Um, so think about, talk a little bit more, each of you, about how you make public-private partnerships work because we all know in practice it's very difficult um, because usually in these situations, well, the private sector wants the public sector to bear all the risk and the public, and, uh, the public sector wants to interfere all the time. And, uh, but you've got some very clean models, uh, you know, 
the public sector creating the platform is wonderful because you get around the, the platform monopoly problem, which God knows we've created in the West. So talk to you, through each of you, uh, Minister Zun, how do you make those sorts of partnerships work? What, what have you learned about what works in, this, in the areas you're talking about and what doesn't? So can I start with you, Mary? Yeah. Um, um, when I think about the way in which we created the super clusters, for example, or the way that we've created sort of uh, venture funding, but you know, but an organization um, you know in Canada called Sustainable Development Technology Canada. I mean, what it really is is a portion of uh, a, a de-risking by government by contributing that investment upfront, knowing that the return on that investment is growth and jobs, right? I mean, so in my case, it's growth and jobs, and um, and. Uh, and, and, and so that calibration of, you know, of, of, I mean, it's a decision. It's a decision that government in public policy make that you want growth in this area, in the intangibles, then what kind of investment do you need to put in there in an effort to create the environment like a super cluster or the actual investment that then raises additional capital or a structure that actually is very focused on more patient capital for green technologies in particular. And then maybe a final point, as the small and medium, like as the, as the small business minister for Canada, um, in, it's so interesting because um, when I read the title of this panel, I use bricks and clicks all the time in, in Canada because I say, for our main streets, one of the things we saw everyone experience this, especially throughout the course of the pandemic, where immediately when our economy shut overnight, you had restaurants or bakeries or or, or, or businesses of, uh, of all types switching almost immediately to e-commerce and utilizing that digital platform as a way of being able to continue to run their business. So in Canada, I have a digital adoption fund because in fact, while a lot of businesses were able to do that, a lot of businesses were not able to do that. And how do you get businesses um, on the main streets to go from brick and adding the click to their brick? Or how do you help businesses um, like manufacturing companies that have used a certain, uh, you know, sort of methodology for uh, for processing, but to actually add robotics to it, to actually add uh, digitization to it, so that they can get greater productivity. In particular, today we have the lowest unemployment rate in Canada. So how do you how do you leverage that particular investment in a way that then allows your companies, your small and medium sized companies, to deal with both sort of the labor issue, but also deal with productivity. So those are the range of calibrations and thinking of how government puts their money in and how we invest, um, certainly in partnership with the private sector. Um, I don't know that there's a, you know, there's a specific calculation, if you will, but, but th those are the considerations as we, you know, as we sort of lay out budget after budget, the investments that are needed for this kind of growth and productivity in intangibles, in the clicks, uh, but also to support the BRICs, which are the traditional industries Canada is a resource-based country. We are a, an advanced manu manufacturing country. Uh, so we, you know, so how do you, how do you also encourage um, that digital, uh, the click side to complement um, the, 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 the changing nature of the economy on the BRICS side? What, uh, Ashwini, if I may follow up, what <coughs> in different ways you has been described as a sort of catalytic role for government? to provide <clears throat> particularly what are essentially, well, in different ways, public goods aspects of the development process. So providing the infrastructure um, and the funding for a superclass is an obvious example. You're providing the platform is an obvious example. And um, is, is that really what you, how you see it, your, your role is catalytic in this way? And where does that take you beyond what you've done? So you think about the future, you, you, you expect and hope for a, it's very clear, the Prime Minister's made this clear, <laughs> rapid growth and therefore lots of further innovation. So what further catalytic, catalytic efforts do you think are justified to push the economy into these new innovative directions? So, <clears throat> I'll give two very specific examples of how we created the public-private partnerships. 
Uh, one is from the BRICS economy, second is from the CLICS economy. From the BRICS economy, let me give the example of the latest uh, 180 kmph train that we have developed. Now, a train running at 180 kilometers per hour, there are about eight countries in the world which have that kind of design capability. It's a very, very complex machine, believe you me. I'm an engineer by training. It's very difficult and very complex piece okay. of engineering. How did we do it successfully in India? How did we design the entire thing, manufacture it in India? We, from the government side, first created a very large demand for it. So a very large order so that anybody who wants to put time, effort, and resources in it should get a sufficient uh, headway, sufficient pathway for taking that product forward. Second, we created the basic framework of the design. Instead of making it a prescriptive or that kind of specification where you are typically buying from somebody, we created a design specification which is more like, okay, you do one thing, I'll do two things, you do three things, together we will design it. So that requires a lot of creative thinking. That's not very easy in public sector. I can uh, vouch for it. It's, it really requires a lot of creative thinking. And that's where our prime minister's resolve comes very clearly forward. And together we designed it, and the trains which are currently running on that technology, <coughs> they have run like, uh, um, if you cover the entire earth, 58 times periphery. So these are very good stable trains from the BRIC economy, right, BRICS economy. From the CLICS economy, uh, developing a complete 4G, 5G telecom stack, because telecom is the backbone of entire digital economy. So, and uh, there are only about five uh, companies which have the complete end-to-end -end, uh, telecom technology stack. So, and people all over the world are looking for good, trusted uh, solutions. So we put our software engineers and our hardware engineers together and started the development process. What normally takes five to six years, we thought of <coughs> compressing it in a time frame of two and a half years. And uh, the solution has come out very well. Again, we took the core, which is the brain of the telecom network, the core network, in the government sector in a public uh, sector company. And the radio network, we opened it up to the private sector. So you can have multiple number of radio network players. They all talk to the same core. Just like the payment system, we developed the platform. So the core is here, the platform. You can have multiple number of players in the radio. So sorry for being very technical on this. The net result of these two examples is, within next three years, India will emerge as a major export house in, uh, major exporting country for telecom technology and train technology. So that is the private-public partnership that we do. And uh, point that you made, Martin, is very important. How do we de-risk the whole process? Private sector, if you burden private sector with risk, then one, they will shy away. Two, they will add costs. So it's very important. And government can take many of the risks which private sector cannot take. So how do we balance that out? If we create such, such contractual structures, such constructs, then I think we have a very good story forward. And we intend to, in India, we intend to replicate these uh, experiences in multiple uh, sectors, including clean energy, power equipment, in other heavy equipment, in mining equipment, in many more sectors, in defense manufacturing. Multiple sectors we intend to keep this growth momentum for. But this is essentially a much more sophisticated and subtle approach to industrial policy than we u we're used to in the sense that you're, t you're, you're trying to create new cap capabilities in your country, and I think it's true of you both, but you're trying to do it with, you're not through a public center ent enterprise, but through creating an enabling environment in which the public sector facilitates the development of the private sector and plays this vital catalytic role. That's what you're trying to do. Exactly. How difficult, could India has, a, how di easy or difficult has it been to get the bureaucracy to do that, or have you actually had to create a new one? 
see the challenges in public uh, sector are it's public's money it's not uh, my money or shareholders money right so one has to be very careful about every dollar that you deploy and uh, we have very strong public auditor uh, in our country we have a very a robust constitutional framework so every dollar that we spend has to be done in a very transparent manner so transparency is fundamental having competitive way of selecting your partner is fundamental to it so creating uh, structures and constructs which enable transparent hassle free and competitive way of selecting the partners is the key to this let me just ask Khalid one question um, obviously very different but from what you said it sounded as though you were as it were I, this is perhaps the wrong metaphor sort of fishing for um, investors who are interested in the region I presume foreign um, technology companies for example yes. and you want to persuade them that your play your country is the right place to go to and you talked about talent as a key element in that are there other things that do you go out looking for companies sort of saying well here are 15 20 companies that might be interested in or we know are interested in doing something in your region and we need to get them and how do you do that uh, very good question is uh, obviously our approach is targeted we do know who can benefit the most we have a good dialogue with many of the largest companies in the world and we know what they're looking for, we know what we have to offer, we know when there is a match, and we have obviously a decent sized team in Bahrain, and we have offices around the world and the largest economies around the world who help us identify those targets. That's part of the story. The other part of the story, we also know that there's a global shortage of coders, and we're willing to invest in a platform where we hire young Bahrainis, and we hire young global talent from all over the world, put it in a platform and with that the biggest companies in the world and this happens is we can have an agreement with SLAs and confidentiality and everything where potentially a big bank or a big consulting firm or big telecom would say that I would need 600 coders for the next six months or eight months and this is what I'm willing to pay for them and I want them to develop this this is also something that we develop where we, we create its pull and we create companies and businesses in Bahrain who have global aspirations and are able to service global companies as part of it. And the EDB is interesting, public partner partnership. The agency reflects that. This is one of the things that we do. We're headed, our chairman is His Royal Highness, Crown Prince, Prime Minister, Chairman of the Economic Development. We report to the head of the government pyramid. Half the board is cabinet ministers, the other half is prominent private sector. We work together to represent investors, diversify the economy. Things are going well in 20 years. Oil used to represent 42% of the economy, today's 18% because of these efforts, because we're able to attract the type of investments that will help grow other sectors and make sure that this, the growth that we have is sustainable. Now, I've done very, very badly on time, but I think this was a very important discussion because what we are moving to clearly across the world is a new approach to industrial policy. And the U.S. has just got into this mega, I suspect, I'm really rather worried about effectively. And I apologize, Jan, but I'm going to go to the floor now. Let's, I'll take a couple of questions. They must be very brief. So, so, we, so does anybody want to ask a question that originates out of this discussion? Or do you now know everything you need to know? Oh, please, tell, <laughs> say who you are and ask your sentence question. Sure. Uh, Matt Guilford, Young Global Leader, working in Myanmar. Quick question. In cases where you cannot completely de-risk the investment, for example, in early stage companies, are you worried about taxpayer blowback from that if things fail? Okay. Um, well, I'll start with Canada and India. I can't imagine that taxpayer blowback is a significant issue in Bahrain, given the nature of the economy <laughs> and who has all the money. So, uh, so um, 
Do tax, I mean, and perhaps the, the key point is, in a way, perhaps to turn around, how do you convince taxpayers that there's value for money in this and that you're not just allowing some fat cats to get incredibly fat and <coughs> we never get anything back? So, Mary, what's your reaction to that? So, transparency, I would agree, is, uh, you know, I would agree with my, uh, my minister colleague, um, is absolutely key um, in the way that uh, that we make the investment commitments through, you know, through through budgets, and you know, and, and, and you don't sort of, you know, you we have these sort of very lengthy contribution agreements, and just a range of uh, modalities that are in there that really is at the end of the day a transparency, and then a, a, a transparency on outcomes as well, not just transparency of the investment. But why do Canadians care? Canadians care because this is about growing the middle class. It's about growing uh, jobs. It's about new, innovative, intangible companies in today's marketplace who are part of communities. And uh, they are women entrepreneurs in Canada. They are indigenous entrepreneurs. They are, uh, they are, uh, they are large entrepreneurs or large uh, companies that, uh, that, that, uh, that are partnering uh, with the government and uh, where we are taking some of that shared risk with them. But in return for what? In return for economic growth in our country, in return for jobs, in return for community growth, in the, and in all of that means a greater social cohesion in, in, in our country. So uh, the, the, uh, the investments are directly tied to uh, the opportunity uh, for Canada and for our communities to create jobs. I like to say they're jobs. It's inclusive growth, so everyone benefits. And, um, and, and they are across communities from coast to coast to coast, including our rural communities and our northern communities. Um, so that's, that's the reason. That seems a pretty good answer. I'm going to see, is that, does that anybody have another question? Because we've got about two minutes. Please. Works. I'm <laughs> sorry. Thank you, Chakunda, for the Global Shapers area. My question is, uh, for low-income markets, how do you choose uh, between bricks or clicks when you don't have the necessary resources to do both? I think these are very good. Perhaps, though this is not ideal in any way because it's very different, but 30 years ago, 40 years ago, India was a low-income country. It isn't now, of course and it has developed a huge IT sector and so forth. But if you look back sort of where you were in 1975 or 1980, and you look at what's come, what are the lessons that you think should be drawn from other, obviously mostly smaller, obviously smaller countries, for how you develop this? Because it didn't come from nowhere. You know, the Indian Institute of Technology and all the rest of it. So. Say a little bit about this. I'm afraid there isn't much time, but that would be, what advice would you give? The role that technology can play, it can accelerate migration from low income to middle income in a very significant way. I can give uh, multiple examples, but one example which is very close to my heart and our Prime Minister has given a very clear target on this, how do we make credit available to a person who's very, very micro business person who requires a $10 credit for two days, three days cycle, right? It's not an easy problem to solve. If we apply our minds, and if we put the entire India stack that we have developed together uh, today, and uh, get the right construct, so today we have a solution where the banks, which would be generally fighting for a $100 million loan to a large corporate group would be making an equal effort at a fraction of the cost to acquire a customer who's seeking $10 loan for three days. And that's amazing. I mean, there is nothing more powerful in economic transformation than getting, providing credit at a fraction of a second, you say, I need this credit now. Within uh, one and a half minutes, the credit is sanctioned and the amount is actually transferred to your account. So create that kind of solution 
and any low income country can phenomenally come out of it. And from India, our Prime Minister's message is, any country who would like to take this, India is stack. It's a solution which is good for developed countries. It's a solution which is good for low income countries. It's a solution which is good for middle income countries. And it's an open source solution. Please adopt it. This is our way of giving back to the world. So the conclusion, which I think is very important, is go and talk to the Indians. Uh, I mean, I thought we'd get there, and I think there's actually a lot to learn from what they've managed to do. It's been quite extraordinary, I mean, in the last 30, 40 years in development. I'm afraid I have to stop this. Uh, I found it actually a very fascinating discussion in many different ways. Uh, but to me, the most interesting thing is the way countries are developing completely new forms of public-private uh, partnership and in a sector where public goods, in economic sense, public goods ideas or issues are so profound, this can work um, immensely powerful. We've seen this in clusters and uh, in other uh, platforms and so forth. But it, I think it's also an area where we all need to learn from the countries that have made progress and share this knowledge so we actually get development and growth out of it, not just rent extraction. Um, so thank you very much, panel. I thought it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.